So just to get uh, those of you that are visiting up to speed, we've seen Nehemiah get news from Jerusalem that uh, the, the city walls are still lying in wreckage. The temple has been rebuilt, but nothing has been done in the city. And as a matter of fact, there were a few years between the, the temple completion and Nehemiah showing up to rebuild the uh, city walls. And in that amount of time, even the temple has just, things have declined at the temple. So when Nehemiah shows up by order of the king or by allowance of the king, we should say, he gets there and Jerusalem's in bad, bad shape. The city walls are all broken down. People are kind of just camped out in what um, was the city in that region there. And there are some people that have been there for some time and they are not really in favor of this whole deal. So right away, Nehemiah assigns sections of the wall to different groups and they begin construction and these enemies rise up and they are named several times in the uh, book of Nehemiah and we're told that they are constantly a problem. Nevertheless, these uh, individuals that are working on the wall are encouraged, they're trusting in the Lord and construction goes ahead and they get these walls built. So when we pick up in chapter six today, we're finding out that actually the construction project has reached its completion. Now, if you've ever been involved in a construction project, when, when you get to that point that you're finished, it is, there's just something about, oh, we're done. Now, if you've ever built a house, for instance, you know that there's always a couple of things that never really quite get done. And the Harrises have been going through that. I keep looking at some things, I'm like, I need to put that trim up. I'll get it this fall, all right? And on we go. And on a bless her kind heart, she said, we're not moving in until every piece of trim is up. But winter was upon us last year, and we said, forget it, let's move in, <laughs> right? So we're still got those little pieces that need to be finished, but, uh, but it's definitely livable. So on we moved. But when, when it's all finished, there is kind of a sigh of relief. Ah, oh, we've got that done. Now, I think that's kind of the situation. The Bible doesn't say, so we can't say for certain, but the walls are all built, but there's still work to be done. And now the city almost has to be defended because people want to come and do harm. So we're going to read the text here. I want you to be familiar with the context before we get into some detail here. But you're going to see very plainly the enemies rising up. That's why I labeled or titled this morning's message, The Shrewd Plotting of an Enemy. You see how they're trying to get to Nehemiah. They want to take him out. The reason Nehemiah's enemies are plotting is that they heard that I had built the wall. You'll see that here in the text. When they found out the wall is built, this gets them really angry. Urgh! They're having success. Kind of like this, this bitterness in their soul is really coming out. And so you see the first plot, and you'll, as we read this, you'll see this coming out, verses 1 through 4. They lure Nehemiah, or they're trying to lure Nehemiah away from Jerusalem. If we can isolate Nehemiah, we can take his life very quickly, very easily. So Nehemiah, come out for this secret meeting. In verses 5 through 8, you're going to see them discouraging by spreading rumors. This plot of the enemy. Well, maybe we can just make Nehemiah so depressed because his name has been slandered in the community and in the area. And then there is plot number three, to sow fear through spies. There's an intimidation tactic that goes on here to which Nehemiah will respond with a prayer. And then there's an infiltration tactic. This man invites him to the temple and says, come to the temple with me, which normally you would think, well, that's probably a good thing. But Nehemiah recognizes uh, 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 this is a trap, the temple, right? So. You'll see these things coming out here. They're trying to get it. Nehemiah 6, 1 through 14 says, Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall that the, and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me saying, Come! Let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief 
And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Can't do it. Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand, wherein was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee in Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. Then I sent unto them, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. For they all made us afraid, saying, their hands shall be weakened from the work that it be not done. Now, therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Afterward, I came unto the house of Shimei, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was shut up. And he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. And I said, Should such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Therefore was he hired so that I should be afraid and do so and sin, and that they might have matter for an evil report, that they might reproach me. My God. Think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat according to these their words and on the prophets, prophetess Nodiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. All right, that's where we're going to stop for today. Now, right off the bat here, he says that the reason that this oppression is coming is because they've heard and they've seen that Nehemiah has built the walls. They're all done. And he even says specifically here, there is no breach left in the walls. There's no crack. There's no weak point. There's no spot where they can get in to the city. So if, if they were to see an attack come, they can close things up and it's all done. The wall is built and complete. But he says, there was one last detail I hadn't got to yet, putting the doors on the gates. And the idea here is that the gates have been formed in the wall and they've got the arches or they've got the beam across there and that's all built, but they haven't got the actual door set in place on the hinges. Uh, when we were in the building process with our house, I had set the door and we still had cabinets and trim and everything we were doing inside. And it was just easier to take the doors off of the hinges. And so for a couple of days, I was keeping an eye out uh, some of you saw we had the fifth wheel parked there and I would look out the window to make sure that the dogs weren't going into the house because the doors were off. Now, they obviously couldn't get through the walls because the walls were all finished, but they could still get through the doors and they would peek their head in and I would open the window. Hey, you get out of there. Right? They'd be looking in there like, hmm. And Anna said, no dogs in the house, even in construction. Get those dogs out of here. So that even now, they will come up to the door, but they won't go in. They know this is not your house. This is our house. You get the wide open outdoors. Go run. Be free. But the house is ours. Well, Nehemiah says, we had, we had built the gates, but we hadn't set the doors yet. Otherwise, the project was, was finished. And you see here that in verses 1 through 4, they're trying to lure Nehemiah away from Jerusalem. And I get the idea here, just based on studying through this passage and what the context here yields, is that there's kind of this sentiment of, why don't you come out to a village in the Valley of Ono, which, if you look on a map, this is, uh, in present day, this is just outside of Tel Aviv, just to the south and east 
of Tel Aviv. It's not that far away from the coast, but it would have been a little bit of a venture from Jerusalem. But why don't, why don't you come out, and there's almost this hint of, and we can celebrate together, or we can talk about this project that you have finished. It'll be, it'll be a, a meeting where, where we can just kind of um, uh, daily and festively uh, rejoice in the work that has been done. But Nehemiah recognizes, wait a second, this doesn't seem right. So there's this tactic of isolation to get you away. Now, just like with Nehemiah, our enemy tries the same exact tactic, and he, he is very successful with this. Let me give you some examples of how this works in our day and age and how the enemy, Satan, and the demonic host, how the, the darkness, the powers of darkness, how they do this in our lives. There is a temptation, especially in 2020, when churches close down, for us to isolate at home and get into the routine of, I just, I don't really need church. I can do worship at home. Do you know anybody like that? I know lots of people like that. Through the years, I've said, hey, why don't you come visit us at church? Well, I worship at home. Uh, what I used to hear a lot in Idaho, I don't hear it as much here, but what I used to hear in Idaho a lot was, I worship out in the outdoors. I just like to be out in nature. That's where I worship the best. Well, while I can certainly understand that sentiment, when I'm out in the mountains, especially on the horses, oh, there is something special about that. And you just can commune with God. It's great, but it is no replacement for church. But the enemy would like to isolate you. Get you away from good fellowship. Get you away from the people where you find encouragement and worship. You do your own thing. The enemy's excellent at this. And we see a pattern of it right here in Nehemiah. Why don't you come out and meet me in this one of these cities in the Valley of Ono? And being there, we can rejoice. Or you can even come to church and you can feel isolated because you have no friends here. I can remember uh, people telling me years and years ago that the, the key is when you come into a church, and if you've ever done this and you've started in at a new church, and this is going to happen to us as we grow, there's going to be people come in here. It's, it's a little different. We are not a real popular church. Uh, when you come in, there's not a disco ball and lights and smoke and mood lighting or coffee shops. And, you know, we're, we're kind of old school around here. So people will come into our building. It has a certain smell. Our linoleum down here in the landing, at some point we'd like to redo the, the entry and all of that. We've already been talking about some of those things. But you come in, that linoleum's kind of old school. You go up those stairs and this building has kind of a, an older smell. You come into the sanctuary and we have pews. I mean, these have been outdated for years. I mean, what church? It, when you build a church nowadays, you don't get pews. This is like a throwback to the 70s. We're, we're kind of old fashioned around here. And that's okay. I love the pews. By the way, if you ever need to take a nap, you're here in the afternoon. They are very comfortable, right? Amen. They're padded, nice, warm. The pews are great. I love the pews. Amen. I would never advocate for getting chairs in here, even though I've had multiple pastor friends say, chairs are the best, right? I like the pews. I, I think they're cool. But people will come into this building to worship, sometimes for the very first time or for the first few times, and they may not know anybody here. And there's a sense of isolation, even though the building may be full. Because I don't know anybody. And it's strange. And they're singing, you know, contemporary songs from the 70s. And, you know, what's going on in this church? Right? And, and they feel kind of weird and displaced. I think it becomes a responsibility then for those of us to, to build some camaraderie right away. You see a new face in the congregation? Talk to them. Let them know, hey, we're glad you're here. You are very welcome. I try to uh, find those visitors when I'm just before the service starts, just to make sure that I greet them and 
let them know, hey, if you need anything, let us know. We're glad you're here today. Join in worship with us. That's a good thing because you can be isolated right here at church even though there's people here. Or ministering by yourself. Uh, th I've done this a few times in my life. And I find it particularly discouraging to go out um, when, especially when something has been organized. We put something together for ministry's sake and you're the only one that shows up. You ever been there? Like, ah, forget it. Forget it. I'm the only person. Nobody cares about this. Well, you know what? There is something about when you put an activity together, a ministry together, and a group shows up, and we work on this together, and we're encouraged by one another. It's fun. A lot better that way. People can feel very dejected when they just go it alone. Or... This one's a tough one. When there is hardship in the church and you feel hard feelings developing and you feel like a church split is imminent. You ever been there? Oh, I hate this. Now, I've been through a couple of church splits in my life and it's the worst because you have people who supposedly are supposed to love the Lord and they're supposed to love one another but before long, there's gossip going on on both sides and there's real division in the church and it should never be that way, but sometimes it happens and people will isolate because either they don't want to be involved, they don't want to pick a side, so I'm just going to do my own thing, or they will pick a side and then they find they're isolated because now they've got this whole element in the church that they used to be friends with that now they're not friends and, and it stinks. We are unified in Jesus Christ and we do not allow the enemy. So be alert, be aware. Don't allow the enemy to cut you out of the herd. Sorry, cowboy <laughs> reference there. But um, that whole idea of we'll just single this one out because before long you fall away. And the enemy is trying to do that to Nehemiah. And I looked at this and I said, this happens in churches sometimes. So be alert. Now notice how Nehemiah deals with this. In verse 3 it says, I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why would or why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? I can't go off to this meeting. I can't be off by myself. I am working for the Lord. I have found great wisdom in this response through the years. Because especially, um, especially when you are working for the Lord, you're going to find, and you no doubt have already, but if you haven't yet, be assured, at some point, the enemy's going to come along and try to discourage you, beat you down, single you out, get you isolated, and then really work you over. But you can overcome that if you stay busy in the cause of Christ. Just keep working for the Lord. Don't get distracted. Don't get pulled aside. Join a legitimate local church. Right? Get involved in a church. I would make a strong suggestion if you're looking. First Baptist Church in East Wenatchee is a good church to be involved. Come on down. Now, if you're here to just make trouble, move along. But if you want to come and worship with us, we would love to have you, right? Join a legitimate local church. Another thing might be make friends. If you come in and you stay for a couple of weeks, you're here for a couple of months, and, and before long you just start getting downhearted. Nobody talks to me. Just by myself. I come into this church and nobody seems to care. pastor doesn't say hi to me anymore. The first couple of weeks he said hi, but he doesn't anymore. Maybe it's just me. Well, have you ever talked to anybody here? Go shake a hand. Introduce yourself. Get to know people. Make friends. Now, some personality types are, this is a struggle. I get it. The introverts that say, oh, I'm, I'm not going to come into a new church and just start making the rounds. Now, I'm the personality type. That's me. Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago, we we're coming back from Utah. Sunday morning, we stopped at for a church in this little town in, in uh, southern Idaho. 
And we pull in, and there were two Baptist churches in this town. And so Anna said, well, this one looks like they're having service today. She's got it mapped out on Google. And so we pulled in there, and we came in. And these are my people. We come in, old building. You walk in. Yep, it's got that old smell. <laughs> probably not just the building's fault, because the average age of attendance was probably 110. <laughs> they were old people, right? And the, the pastor comes walking up to me, a little short guy. Boy, he shakes my hand all enthusiastic. It's like they probably haven't had a visitor in years. We're so glad you're here today. And I looked him right in the eye with a sparkle, and I said, we are so glad to be here. Come in, make yourself at home. He said, we have breakfast out here. Coffee's waiting. Do you want a cup of coffee? No, I'm good. All right, we don't do that in our church. Um, <laughs> come on, in. make yourself at home, right? And then they're singing these uh, songs. It was like, it was so great. I was right at home. So he tells me after the service, he said, after he, we'd visited a little bit, he knew I was a pastor. He said, please be praying for us. I'm retiring in October and we don't know what we're going to do. And I mean, there were, there were, I think, 20 people in church, and so my family made up four of the 20. We don't know if we should close the church down and be done. We don't know if we should call a pastor to try to rebuild, and we're really split. Some of the deacons believe we should rebuild. Some of the deacons think we should just close it down. I said, okay, I will be praying. Before we left, one of the deacons that was in favor of rebuilding comes up and says, you know any pastors who would be interested? I said, no, but I know a number of churches that are in your position. There's a shortage of men that are coming up through the ranks to fill these positions and take the work on. I said, it's tough going out there. I said, but if I come across somebody that I think would be a good fit, please know I'll be sending them your way. Oh, please do. But he didn't want to see us leave, right? He keeps following us along and he cuts us off and he keeps talking and keeps talking and keeps talking. All these things. I'm the kind of person who came in and then by the end of the service, I knew everybody there. But not everybody's like that. Some people come in and they just kind of sit in their spot. This is new. I don't know anybody here. This is strange. You know? If you're one of those people, don't worry about... Uh, what people are going to think, make friends. Because the enemy wants to get you isolated. Don't give him that ground. Or join or invite participation in a ministry. Get involved. Uh, as a result of this point, this week I thought through, what are some ways in which you could get involved in our church? And I just, just started brainstorming. What are some possibilities here? They are numerous. Mostly because we're a small church, there are lots of opportunities here. So I put a list on the, on the back shelf there on the way out today. If you are interested at all, you're like, you know, I, I'd like to be involved here in this church. Maybe there's something I could do. Take a look through that. They're just ideas. Maybe you look through that and you say, mm -hmm, none of these really are my cup of tea. They don't, it's not doesn't fit my ministry set or my, my gift set, and I, I don't really know how I can do Pray about how the Lord would use you because getting involved keeps the enemy from parting you out on your own. This is, uh, this is Nehemiah's defense here. Why would I go? I'm working. I'm doing things. I can't go get away and meet with you. Yet they sent unto me four times. Notice the persistence of the enemy. He's not going to give up on that first time because you say, I'm going to church today. So you go that first week and he's like, ah, oh, I lost him. Don't you know that he's going to keep coming and giving you all kinds of excuses? Don't go to church. You can worship at home. You can tune in to uh, Andy Stanley. You can tune in to, to uh, Jeremiah, David Jeremiah. You can tune in to Alistair Begg. Ooh, that's a good one. I'd be, I'd be almost tempted to stay home and listen to Alistair rather than dry as toast, Pastor Harris, Alistair Beck, oh. or all these guys, right? I can stay at home and tune in. But then you miss the worship. You miss involvement with other Christians. Don't give the enemy way there. So this tactic of isolation, keep working. Plot number two, discouraged by spreading rumors. 
Now, I will tell you, it's never bothered me that people have gossiped about me through the years. But what really bothers me, the weird thing in my mind is, is that I worry about what people may say. Once they start saying things, it doesn't really bother me too much. But I kind of worry about what, what might some, you know, what might be some things that they would be spreading out there in the community. Because of great value to me is my testimony. If I lose my testimony as a pastor, I feel like then what, what opportunity do I have in the ministry? What could people say out there? I worry, oh man. They could fabricate all kinds of things and people will believe them and then the next thing you know, I am no longer effective in ministry. You worry about people believing rumors about you? Notice what happens here in this context. Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand wherein was written, it is reported. The word is going out. The rumor is spreading. It is reported among the heathen and Gashmu saith it that thou and the Jews think to rebel. You know what they're saying out there? They're saying that you guys rebuilt Jerusalem and you mean to make your stand now against the Persian Empire and you are going to do your own thing and the prophets have come along and you are raising them up to report that you're setting yourself up as the king. So it's going to be King Nehemiah in defiance of Artaxerxes. And he says, I love this, verse 8, there are no such things done as thou sayest. That's not the truth. So the plot here, the tactic is to distract by ruse, rumors that you aren't fit. Rumors and, and the word going out out there in the community. This is a tactic of the enemy. Have you ever had something come back to you? People have been talking about you. That stings, doesn't it? Nobody likes that. But the enemy will do this. And this is what they're telling Nehemiah. This is the report that's going on. Rumors that you aren't fit. Your reputation is already bad. You know, I've heard a number of people who come to know the Lord and they get saved from a very rough background, but then they begin to struggle because they feel like, I, I can't work for the Lord. People know me in this town. And, and I've been out there with the worst of them. I, I, there's no way that I'm going to be effective because the word's already out on me. Not realizing that God can do uh, beyond that. One of my fears is that, um, and this is why I try to study hard, because I would never want it going out in the community, and I, it worries me to think that this could ever happen, that I don't know what I'm talking about. That you come in here and I'm preaching a bunch of just nonsense, and it's easy to disprove. You compare it with God's Word and you say, He's not preaching truth. Oh, this. Uh, I never want to be guilty of that. So I want to study hard. Your sin is too bad. Right? The word going out in the community, maybe that's the thing. The enemy wants to distract by ruse. So the response, just like in verse 8 with Nehemiah, but wait a second. What's the truth of the matter? And we can have confidence in the truth because the truth never, ever changes. That's right. No matter how much you push on it and no matter how much you test it, it is going to stay. It's, it's not moving. This is one of the reasons why through the years I've told people, if you don't know and you're not convinced of the truth of Christianity, put it to test. Because if you test the Scriptures, if you test Jesus Christ and you find that they fail, then you should pitch this. You should move on. Christianity is not true. It's not right. I'm moving on to the next thing. Let's test out Buddhism. Let's test out Hinduism. Let's test out all of these other religions. Because here's the confidence that I have when I tell people that. You put the Bible to a test. You put Christ to test. It's not moving. It is going to come through. And I can tell you that because I myself have been there. I've put the Bible to test. I've put Christ to test. God, and not, not because I was trying to be an enemy as much as 
I want to know before I get up and I preach this word that it is absolutely reliable and that I'm not misleading you all. God, prove to me the, the veracity of your word. And he has multiple times. The more I test God's word, the more I find it to be absolutely reliable, true. So come back to truth. The truth of the matter is, it isn't about you and I. What goes on and what word is said about you in the community matters very little. We are about the work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul said, um, when I came to you, I didn't come with flattering words and I didn't come with the wisdom of man, even though you had a Greek mindset and you love this wisdom. I didn't come to you with all of that stuff. I came and preached Christ and him crucified. That was it. And think about how they perceived Paul. He'd come into a new community, Acts tells us, over and over and over again. Paul would come in on the Sabbath day to the Jews. He would preach Christ crucified and him risen from the dead. And some of the Jews would say, this is what we've been looking for. They would readily accept Christ as their Savior. Excuse me. Others would say, this is interesting. We want to hear more about this. We're not convinced yet, but interesting. And then some said, he's preaching heresy. This is blasphemy. And they would stone him. They'd drag him outside of town so that he would die. And, and they left him for dead multiple times. Do you think that those people that stoned Paul went back into town and said, what a great guy? <laughs> no. They came back and they said, this is a loser. If he comes back into town, which they wouldn't have said because they thought he was dead, right? But when they heard that he was alive, if he ever comes back here again, don't listen to him. The man is spreading lies. So they would tell all of their Jewish friends. Think about how this must have gone. They would meet at synagogue the next Sabbath day and they would say, that Paul... No good. We've got to reverse that doctrine because he's spreading lies about this Jesus who rose from the dead, apparently. Don't listen to him. The man has obviously lost his mind. But did that stop Paul? Did Paul ever give up and say, oh, this stinks. Now my reputation's ruined in Ephesus. I can never go back there again. No. No. Because he knew the truth. It wasn't about him. And it's not about us. The community can think what they're going to think about you and I. The important question is, what do they think about Jesus? That's the important thing. Are we pointing them to Christ? Because my reputation doesn't matter as much as the reputation of Jesus Christ. Come back to the truth. What are we about here? Nehemiah says... There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. You're inventing these stories. You're coming up with these things on your own because the reality is very different. The truth doesn't change. And then the last plot, and this, is, this comes in a couple of forms here. They sow fear. And in this passage, they, they sow fear through spies. You find in verse 9 this, this tactic of intimidation. For they all made us afraid. I looked at this and I thought, really? Were they afraid? That's what he says. They made us all afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work that it, shall be, not, that it uh, be not done. They've been working so hard. And they've been putting in long days. And now their bodies are just fatigued. All of the energy is spent. So... Now, they're, because they're weak, now would be an ideal time to attack. We can get them now. And you notice uh, Nehemiah's response to this. If the intimidation factor here, you haven't got what it takes. Or maybe it's as simple for us as, uh, you're kind of dumb for believing in Christianity. I've had people actually with that attitude talk to me before like, you know, you seemed kind of intelligent until you told me you were a Christian. Now you seem like a real idiot. And they kind of look down their nose at you like, I can't believe you buy into all that Jesus stuff. I can't believe that you actually believe the Bible is true. Are you kind of messed up? Obviously so. And it, and it can be concerning. I think, oh man, am I really nuts for believing this? 
right? Is, could it be that way? But Nehemiah's response in verse 9 is, he prays, now therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Maybe my hands are weak. This has been a long and difficult project. So God, give me the strength that I need to move forward and to defend the work that's been done because they want to intimidate me. But God can enable us to move forward. And then he goes on. This, the next tactic here in sowing fear is through infiltration. Now, this is the one that really got me. So far, we're going through all of this. You see exactly the attacks and the, the plots of the wicked and the enemies of Nehemiah here. But then it gets to verse 10. And it says, Afterward, I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetibel, who was shut up. And he said... Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. Now when you first read that verse, you think, ah, oh, Nehemiah has an ally. He has somebody who cares about him and says, why don't you come to the temple? There's a plot out and they're, and they're looking to take your life. But if you'll come to the temple with me, I can keep you safe there. We'll, we'll find that, that uh, inner chamber, we'll lock the door, and they won't get you. And you and I will be safe. Now, how many of us, if that had been said, would have said, sounds good to me, let's go. <coughs> Save my life, brother. But Nehemiah doesn't. And I said, should such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced his, this prophecy against me for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. You see what this is saying? In the words of the, of the mafia, they put a hit out on Nehemiah. And this man came along and said, oh yeah, I'll take that. So his, his strategy is lure Nehemiah over to the temple, to the house of God, and pretend that this sanctuary is a place of refuge. But when he gets in there, what's he going to do? He's going to kill Nehemiah because he's been hired by Nehemiah's enemies. Oh, what a dark plot. I mean, you would think... Let me illustrate it this way. It would be like you and I being summoned or being asked to come to the church in the midst of, of oppression and in the midst of, of difficulty. And they say, let's meet at the church. We'll find safety at the church. I would believe that. I'll tell you something. Through the years uh, in our previous church, we had a lady there that said she would come into the church and if she was there by herself in, at night and it was dark, she just felt like it was creepy in the church. And I used to think, that's so odd. Because I've never been in the church where I felt like that. I've always felt like when I came into the church, this was a, the whole place was just blessed and protected by God. I love to be here. I love to come into the sanctuary in the middle of the week. It's kind of weird because this is a place of worship and I'm used to being with you all in worship here. So to be here by myself is kind of a weird thing. But you walk through the aisles and you just feel like this is the place where God meets with us. I love it. It does feel safe. It does feel protected. So if somebody was to say to me, why don't you meet me at the church? We'll be safe at the church. I would say, sounds good. You should be safe at the church. But Nehemiah perceives, uh, 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 this guy is lying. We have a problem here. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so and sin and that they might have matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. Nehemiah's understanding here saves him. And, as we've been kind of making a comparison between what's going on with Nehemiah and the attacks in our own life as the enemy tries to exploit our weaknesses. 
the tactic for infiltration might be that we vest too much. That we try to run our own agenda in the church, perhaps. Like somehow we're going to find safety here, but it's got to be my way. Combat that with understanding. This is a lesson that God taught me in our very first pastorate. Matter of fact, the, it spanned over a couple of pastorates. The very first church that I pastored, many of you know my testimony, the church split. We were there for two years and things went really fast. <coughs> and it was ugly and hurtful. And, and I questioned whether or not I was really called out of ministry. I thought, man, this stinks. I, maybe God's telling me this is not what you're supposed to be doing. So two years into the ministry, the church split, and I didn't know what to do. So I did what I was convinced was my responsibility, and I kept studying God's Word, and I kept preaching God's Word. And we stayed another two years. We had consistently coming in those next two years about seven people. And it was tough going. I would preach to those seven people. Uh, we just barely had seven because Andrew had been born. <laughs> but kept preaching, kept preaching. Eventually that church closed its doors. I was discouraged. This is not how this is supposed to go. At all, right? I mean, you're supposed to come in and you love the Lord. We love the Lord. The church grows, right? That one closed down after a lot of heartache. The Lord moved us to the church in Idaho. And I didn't know what to do there except study the word, preach the word. So that's what I did. And that church grew. <coughs> and I thought, well, I'm not doing anything differently. What's this about? And I learned this lesson. It's God's church. It's not my church. And the success of the church is not dependent upon how enthusiastic I am from behind the pulpit. It's not as uh, much a matter of how eloquent I am, praise God. How articulate I am, praise God. It's God's church. And if we will hold to His Word, He will do the work in building or closing it because it's His. And I was so relieved when I learned this. I think that there's some real comfort in that here, in that understanding. Because here the attack comes with infiltration, getting in the midst, getting in, involved here. I believe, just by the context here, verse 10, that when this man comes to him, this is not somebody that Nehemiah knows as an enemy. This is somebody that he would have perceived probably as a friend. But he sees that something's not right here and finds out that this man's actually been hired by his enemies. You know, we come into the church expecting that all of the people here are just friends and family, and we want it to be that way. But sometimes the enemy gets a hold of people in the church, and they start causing a problem. And we don't, we try to individually purpose before the Lord, God, I don't want to be that weak link. I don't want to be the, the one that the enemy gets a hold of to sow seeds of discord in the church, so help us. Help us. But it can happen, and it does happen on occasion. So, how do we battle against this? What we see here in this, uh, in this passage. You find, by the way, uh, Nehemiah's response in verse 14 as he issues up this prayer. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sambalat according to these words, these their words, works, and on the prophetess Nadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. You know what's going on there, God. And hold this against them. I think that some good ways to combat this is to know your place in the ministry. This is what God wants me to do, and I'm going to do it faithfully. And the other thing is to know your comrades. Know those that are working with you here. Because when somebody comes along and they're working against you, you'll be able to see that really, really quickly. Wait a second, you're not on the same team. You're wearing our jersey, but you're not on our team. 
you would all know something was up if I got up here to preach one day and I was wearing a Seahawks jersey. <laughs> yeah, you, you got the right look, but we know what's really going on in your heart. <laughs> I think what's happening here in this passage, as we've looked at it, is the enemy has come in this subtle way to try to get Nehemiah to the temple. Wow. To even use God's temple that way. God holds the balances. He's attentive to the work of our enemies. He knows. I can't tell you how many times, just since I've been here in the last couple of years, how many times I've prayed over this property, how many times I've prayed in the sanctuary for the protection of God's people here. It is a consistent prayer of mine. Because I know that the enemy would love to come along and tear this up. But I also know that when Jesus Christ is building his church, he said the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And I pray for protection and success in the ministry that God's name would be carried forward through this work at First Baptist Church in East Financial. That he would just keep doing great and marvelous things here. So, for us, the challenge is to serve by conviction and stay faithful. I think Nehemiah is an excellent example of that. He just kept doing what he was supposed to do. But what about the rumors in Jerusalem? Just did what he was supposed to do. But what about this meeting over in the Valley of Honor? No, just do what I'm supposed to do. But they're coming to get you, Nehemiah. You should come find safety and refuge in the temple. No, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. I think all of us can learn from that. Let's do what we're supposed to do and stay busy, stay diligent, stay on task. As my mother used to say when we were homeschooling, it's hard being at the kitchen table and looking outside and seeing all the fun things that you can do. And my mother would say, stay on task, stay on task. That's what we do in Christianity and in our service for the Lord. Stay on task. 